So joining us here for another short webinar hosted by Hydroterra. I uh, hope you're all staying safe out there in these trying times. Um, these webinars will be an ongoing exercise for us for the coming weeks and months on a whole range of various technologies and suppliers that we represent here at Hydroterra. Uh, so just be on the lookout for these in the not too distant future as we continue to provide you with these uh, short webinars and uh, appreciate you all taking the time to hopefully expand uh, your knowledge and guide your decisions a, a bit better when selecting appropriately in, in this instance, a uh, silenced pneumatic pump that may meet your needs. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar uh, with myself, um, my name is Kyle McLaren. I'm the sales manager here at Hydroterra and I'll be uh, taking you through today a bit of a comparison between two of the uh, Solence pumps in the 407 bladder pump and the 408 double valve pump. Uh, I'm also joined by Michelle who is, our, is the general manager here at Hydroterra um, and is our organiser for these webinars. So thanks Michelle for making sure that things uh, run smoothly with these. So just a bit of housekeeping uh, firstly for those who uh, haven't joined us uh, in a webinar before. Uh, we have a questions or Q&A box uh, at the top here and please as we go along um, if you guys have any burning questions feel free to type those into the questions box and, and leave a bit of time at the end uh, uh, to read those out and I'll answer as many as I can. Um, we run out of time, I'll endeavour to answer those uh, individually, but we'll, uh, we'll try and answer as many as we can today uh, with everyone present. So we see this opportunity uh, when a lot of us maybe have uh, a bit more time at home, um, in the case of our fellow Victorians at the moment, uh, to be able to generate uh, greater technology awareness, I suppose, on uh, what may be out there and what we've seen. Um, stimulate some learning through training, but also just get an insight into uh, what you guys um, are doing. Uh, we're always interested here at Hydroterra uh, in the new and exciting projects uh, that are out there. And, uh, you know, what, what are you guys uh, missing? What would you like to see? This really helps us, I suppose, develop uh, and grow into a business that can assist our clients as uh, effectively and efficiently as we can. So just quickly, as I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with Solenced, um, but on the off chance that there are some of you which may uh, not have heard of them, we've represented Solenced here in Australia as exclusive distributors for around 14 or 15 years now. Um, they're a Canadian company uh, with over 40 years in developing environmental monitoring technology and one of the few remaining environmental companies are still independently owned. Uh, in the coming weeks and months, we'll be going uh, through a few of the technologies offered by Solenced, in particular, uh, the level loggers, which are quite popular with our clients, multi-level systems, uh, piezometers, uh, and in this case today, some of the uh, pneumatic offerings for, um, for groundwater pumps. So the program today, I'm just going to run through a bit of the specifications on both the 407 and the 408 uh, double valve pump. We'll look at the differences between the two pumps, a bit of a cross comparison uh, between the two, which will um, help in your selection process. Um, a bit of the solvents controller options and air supply options as well. Uh, we'll probably do a separate webinar on on that. Um, I'll just touch quickly on that um, today, um, but there's a lot to talk about in that space. So uh, there'll probably be a separate webinar uh, which will delve into those in a little bit more detail. The troubleshooting tips that we've found um, in our time here with these pumps um, and our experiences with them that can probably assist you guys uh, in future when utilizing these types of uh, pumps from Solence. And just uh, a few previous case studies that uh, we ourselves have worked on and that might be of interest to you uh, following up finally with uh, a bit of a Q&A at the end here. So it's a program that we're going to be running. 
So we'll jump into it. Uh, the 407 bladder pump um, is a 316 uh, stainless steel pump, which comes in a, a couple of sizes. Uh, there's the more common sort of 1.66 inch diameter, and that's for most um, two inch bore applications that we see. Uh, with our clients, there's also the more narrow uh, one inch pump, uh, which just gives you a bit more flexibility. Um, I'll talk more extensively about uh, the point shortly uh, in the maximum operation uh, depths. Um, but the, the bladder pump has a maximum lift uh, of 150 meters um, below ground level. And that's within uh, both of the diameter ranges there. So um, the bladders are available in uh, your more common uh, low density you know, polyurethane. Um, Sort of in the more portable systems uh, and changing them from bore to bore that's commonly what we see uh, there's also uh, teflon bladders uh, which are much more durable and more so for the dedicated applications uh, when wanting to dedicate these pumps uh, in the bores um, having the bladder in these pumps obviously means that we're uh, avoiding as best as possible the contact of our air supply or gas supply with the sampling water uh, which is good for our sort of VOC monitoring. Um, so if this is a requirement or and sort of tossing up on pump, pumping options, then the bladder pump would probably be uh, best suited for this, um, provided again, you don't have the depth limitations as um, said uh, above. Uh, when we say, when I say less fine tuning uh, there in the operation, what I mean by that is, uh, when talking about our drive and vent times, um, meaning uh, the time where we apply our air source being the drive uh, and the time that we let the bore actually recover being the vent. Um, it's a bit more forgiving, uh, unlike the uh, double valve pump, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, but essentially, if I have my little cursor here, um, the drive time, we're applying our air through the drive line and compressing that bladder and our vent time is allowing that bladder to re-expand and have new water come in, uh, which allows us to repeat the cycle and send that back up the, the line. So um, we see, sorry, I've skipped a slide there. We see the maximum flow rates. Um, they have about 1.5 uh, litres per minute. You can expect that uh, the closer you reach to that maximum deployment depth, uh, you may be struggling to reach uh, this amount most commonly the bladder pumps aren't typically used for purging purposes so there isn't a, too much of a worry on those uh, maximum flow rate numbers um, this more so comes into play a bit more with the double valve um, which we'll discuss um, there's the capability of the drop tube assembly to put onto these uh, 407 pumps so this moves the screen intake of the pump uh, to deeper depths uh, with some tubing in between, so some 3 8 inch tubing, uh, whilst keeping the pump at a level uh, that is still capable uh, for your equipment at, at the surface. So what we're doing is we're taking this lower section here of the pump uh, screen intake down further uh, with some 3 8 tubing, but we're still calculating our PSI and our drive and our vent times based on the, um, the where the bladder is situated still. Uh, within the bore. So hydrostatic pressure is going to lift that water from wherever you've set that drop tube assembly um, and pump intake. Um, and as an example, if I'm setting my pump, you know, at 50 metres and putting my drop tube intake at 200, I'd still be calculating my pressure from, from 50, from 50 metres, um, but I'll be drawing water from that deeper depth. Um, with both the, the 407 and the 408, we have the ability uh, and have done so quite uh, a lot in dedicating these pumps to individual bores. So uh, why would you maybe want to do this? Well, uh, we know that having dedicated pumps provides us with uh, some of the best sort of representative aquifer data. Obviously, we're going to get less mixing of column water due to the fact we're reducing that installation amount uh, to and fro that particular bore. Um, we'll get quicker sampling rounds um, if the pumps, you know, if we dedicate these pumps uh, in the first round, you know, and uh, 
you have maybe slightly deeper, deeper applications which take a bit longer to install these. Well, if they're already there and they're dedicated, you can save uh, a lot of man hours coming back and having to sample these maybe quarterly or biannually, um, that type of thing. So the dedication is capable again with the 407 and both the 408. So with the 408, uh, available in some different, couple of different sizes, there's the 1.66 inch, um, this is again the uh, most common, but there's also the, uh, the much narrower 5 8 inch double valve pump and also the micro double valve pump for um, CMT, so multi-channel um, tubing, that sort of honeycomb tube. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the micro double valve pump um, when we do our multi-level uh, webinar. So we can touch more on uh, the inner workings of that particular pump. Um, the maximum operation limit, and this is probably the main differential between your 407 and your 408, is that if we have, we're actually calculating our pressure range is not based on the pump intake, but actually on our standing water level. So if the standing water level is less than 150 metres, theoretically we can put this pump anywhere. So as an example, the sort of maximum depth that uh, we've sampled from is around the 1200 metre mark below so you know quite deep um, you just have more flexibility there um, the pump doesn't contain any bladders so when I talked before about the 407 uh, bladder pump having uh, less fine tuning with the 408 you might have more flexibility of having an option for uh, quite a low flow uh, application so maybe less than 100 mil per minute um, all the way up to some sort of flow rates in the 3.5 litre per minute ranges. Um, but again, we require a bit more fine tuning uh, required uh, in terms of our drive and vent times. If we want to um, limit the contact of our air supply uh, with our sample water. So what we're doing is that we're actually applying our drive gas onto uh, the drive line that the water has come back up to static water level. So if we want to avoid having that contact uh, with our sample water down here, this just needs to be a bit more fine tuning our drive and vent, which in the next slide, I'll just discuss how to work around that. Um, again, there's no need for the drop tube assembly with these um, because we're, we're calculated from the standing water level, as I said, um, and there's also the ability to dedicate these um, double valve pumps. So what's a bit of a, what are the differences? So a bit of a cross uh, side by side comparison uh, of these two pumps. Aside from the pump materials, both being 316 stainless, you have uh, a couple of different diameters, which I mentioned earlier. Um, that just gives us, uh, I guess the point being that there's flexibility there to uh, potentially have an option um, no matter what diameter your bores may be, um, there might be a, a narrow enough pump to utilise with any sort of uh, bore diameter in that instance. So there's just a range of different uh, sizes there that we uh, can suggest. Um, calculating our PSI, uh, calculating our drive and calculating our vent, uh, the three points that I'll speak about. Uh, which is the main point of contention, I suppose, and the questions that I get asked uh, the most. Um, so what we've tried to provide here um, is just a quick way of being able to calculate your PSI ranges, calculate your drive times and calculate your vents quite quickly. Um, so as I said previously in the 407 bladder pump, we're calculating our PSI based on the pump intake. So where the pump is sitting basically. Um, now, if the drop tube uh, is in there and you've actually put the pump intake down a bit lower, you're just basically calculating where the bladder actually is in the pump. So this uh, calculation here, which is the times 3.3 divided by 2.3 plus 10, uh, is directly coming from science themselves where they say that uh, one PSI can lift a 2.3 foot column of water. So what we're doing is we're taking wherever our pump is sitting in meters and we're times it by 3.3 to get a foot conversion. 
dividing it by that 2.3 foot. And then the plus 10 there is uh, what we call line loss. Um, so allowance for that. So you will get some bleeding through your tubing and that sort of thing. So it's just good to put um, a number there that can uh, compensate for that, that line loss bleed. Um, calculating uh, the PSI for the double valve pump, the equation is exactly the same, but instead from of the pump intake, again, we're actually calculating from the standing water level. Um, so you're going to get uh, more flexibility um, in being able to sample from deeper depths, but maybe require less hardware or less robust hardware at the top to try and meet massive PSI requirements. Um, so that just gives you a bit more flexibility there. So Calculating a drive, there's um, a couple of uh, easy ways to, to do this. Um, in the 407 bladder pump, the quickest way to calculate a drive is that if we've set our pump uh, down where we need it to be, um, we can actually time uh, application of our drive and we can submerge our, our sample line, which will be our 3 8 inch uh, line tubing in a, just a bucket of water. And so if we apply our drive gas and we see bubbles coming from that sample line, what that's telling me is that our drive gas is compressing our bladder as we want it to be uh, and it's forcing water up that sample line and actually expelling the air within that sample line as well, which is the bubbles. So if you're seeing, uh, if you've submerged your, your sample line just in a bucket of water and you're applying drive gas and you see that there's bubbles coming out of that line that tells you that water is on its way, basically. Um, and when those stop, that when the bubbles stop in that line, that also tells me that the bladder is being compressed uh, to its maximum amount. So no more water is going to come out as I'm applying my drive gas. Uh, so we say about 80% of that time is a good time to encapsulate sort of emptying the bladder as much as possible once we've applied our drive gas um, and just allowing uh, when, our, when we're calculating our vent to have that to be about two or three times that drive amount as a minimum. Now that's going to be based on uh, whether it's the 407 or the 408. It's going to be based on your uh, recovery of your bore. So just calculating your vent quickly, if you can do a two or three times multiplier on that drive time, it's a good start point. But always each bore is unique as we know. Um, just make sure you're not drawing down um, within your guidelines and uh, you can bump up your vent to allow a bit more recovery um, on that. So with the 408 double valve pump, uh, if we move to the calculation of the drive there, um, a little bit trickier that uh, our purge sample line uh, of all the water once we've actually sat the pump in place at the start, and then what we can do is we can apply our drive gas and we'll see water being expelled from the sample line and eventually the air will be expelled. Now that tells me that the drive gas has made a full loop from uh, the uh, tubing where the air is being applied all the way down through the pump and back up the sample line to be complete a full circle. So we say 40% of that time that we've timed whilst we've applied our drive gas is a good start point in the double valve pump. Why? I'll just go back one here, if you can see my cursor there. Why we say 40%? Well, if we assume that um, the drive line, the pump and the sample line is 100%, if we've applied our drive gas and we've put it all the way through this tubing, it's gone down through the pump and back up the sample line to be expelled at the surface, that's completed a full loop. So 50% would be if we sort of cut this pump down the middle, that's 50% of our time being applied in the drive line, and obviously a little bit less than that uh, will allow us to not have the air whilst we, when we start sampling to be in contact uh, with your sample line, uh, with your sample water in here, uh, and just allow that recovery. So each time we vent, the drive water will come back up to standing water level, which is here. So all we're doing is applying gas getting down just before the pump, allowing it to vent and coming back up to standing water level and repeating that process. So if that process is uh, done correctly, we should be avoiding our air contact uh, with our sample water. 
So again, our maximum depth ranges I've also included there on this table, um, 150 meters below ground level with the, the bladder pump. And again, less than 150 meters, you just get that, if you just keep those point uh, in your mind, that if you have a standing water less than 150 meters, then the, the double valve pump is probably where you want to go if you want to sample deeper than 150. Um, just a quick touch point as well is that the drive and sample lines uh, on the tubing out of the box, these pumps will have the air and sample line swapped around. So on the 407 bladder pump, you have the quarter inch tubing being the air and the 3 8 inch being the sample. Uh, on the 408 double valve pump, you have the 3 8 being the air and the quarter inch being the sample. Now I've put that this can be changed here because uh, nine times out of 10, we do change that. If we go to add double valve pumps into our rental fleet, for example, um, we simply swap those connections back around to have our preferences having the quarter inch air 38 sample. It doesn't affect anything internally in the pump. It just allows us to um, have less PSI requirements um, when we're calculating that sort of stuff for deeper applications um, due to reducing the diameter of that drive tubing um, from three eighths to a quarter uh, we're just uh, allowing ourselves to have more allowance with our gear so i always suggest to switch them around um, but just to be aware of that so the silence controller and air supply options as i said previously at the start uh, we might do another webinar on this because it's um, quite a bit of extensive um things that we can delve into on this but just quickly i'll talk about um the 464 controller and the 12 volt compressor from the silence range um, the silence 464 controller comes in uh, a 125 psi rating and a 250 psi rating um, there's a manual drive button uh, on the controller uh, which eliminates electronics and I'll, I'll just talk a bit about that a bit more when, when we get to the troubleshooting um, there's also the option to store up to uh, 99 saved um, channel logs in in the actual controller itself so for example if you've dedicated um, a suite of bores and you've, you've got 30 pumps uh, in there and you've done your first round of sampling you've worked out with your calculations your drive and vent times are all sitting fine and the bores recovering nice uh, you're able to save those um, settings that you previously had in your controller uh, named under the particular bore so if you're going back um, you know and doing quarterly uh, analysis or biannual analysis then you can uh, just again reduce those times of having to calculate those things and start to reduce your man hours that way so that's a good uh, little feature with that control unit uh, the silence 12 volt compressor uh, we say is ideal for uses uh, in bores of sort of less than 30 meters. Uh, we say that because um, what we know about the compressors is that they're trying to maintain um, a pressure rating within the chamber. So the Solens 12 volt compressor does have 125 psi uh, maximum output. But if we have a large sweep of sort of deeper bores, um, it's the compressor or any compressor will be trying to maintain that pressure within the chamber constantly. Um, if we're applying high um, PSI uh, air to a lot of our bores and utilizing the same uh, compressor, it will be running for quite a long time to try and maintain that pressure within the, within the compressor and can run the risk of burning out. So blowing a fuse or something like that. So we sort of say it's really ideal for the shallower applications just to try and limit that. Um, you can utilize them for maybe a couple of a couple of deeper bores if you wanted to but we you know just as a rule of thumb uh, better for the shallow applications because again you can uh, run the risk of, of blowing that uh, fuse or, or burning them out and so there is a lot of technical guidance on changing uh, fuses and and uh, troubleshooting on the on the compressor if that was to happen um, both on our uh, hydrotail website and on the Solnodst uh, website also um, the main the main ones we start to move to is the compressed gas for anything sort of deeper so uh, our co2 uh, or nitrogen is typically used as our inert gases there um, the preference for one or the other 
can depend on um, what you may be sampling for. Sometimes people typically like to use nitrogen as it's typically a more, if you will, inert gas. Um, and you can actually achieve uh, a bit higher PSI ratings if you're wanting to do deeper uh, applications. Um, mostly we utilize CO2 at Hydroterra, um, but again, you have the flexibility uh, there of being able to choose. So what are some troubleshooting tips for these? Um, if you guys are familiar with the science controller, uh, I try and get this point across in that um, there's some preset um, low flow settings suggested on the controller face um, in terms of a recommended low flow sampling rate. We always, uh, I always ask that you, you don't use those preset settings um, for a couple of obvious reasons. Um, example being that the low flow setting uh, that's a preset on that science controller is set to uh, 50 seconds drive and 25 seconds vent. If you remember previously what I said, you want to try and have your vent to be two or three times your drive, not the other way around, because we're trying to allow that board to recover and be able to take as best as we can a representative from that um, particular aquifer. So I just suggest that those calculations that we've talked about before to utilize them and to not utilize the preset settings on the science controller. Um, in our rental fleet, we've taken steps to provide people with a bit of a cheat sheet on those calculations um, and re refer them to that from the um, science controller. Um, if that's something that might be of interest to people, we're happy to um, send through that, that cheat sheet uh, to you all. Um, don't forget to use your manual drive button. So that's helped me. Um, personally with a couple of uh, bores to get that final couple of samples. What that does is that that silver button on top of the science controller will allow you to bypass any uh, electronics or anything like that. So if I press that manual drive button down, uh, that's actually uh, applying a drive cycle. Uh, if I release it, that's, that's a vent. So I can sit there with my watch or my phone. And uh, if I've maybe forgot to pack uh, the batteries, uh, I can still utilize the controller and just bypass any electronics with that manual drive button. So that's a handy thing that's, that's, that's helped me in my time. Um, don't be afraid to slightly increase your PSI. So um, if you're not seeing water coming up, um, those uh, calculations that we've suggested previously aren't, um, you know, set in stone. They're just uh, guidelines to initiate. Um, so if you're again utilizing that that uh, method of submerging your sample line in a bucket of water and you're still and you're seeing bubbles maybe not so many um it suggests that you're probably um you know water's coming up but you might just not have enough psi to to get it up there so don't be afraid to sort of bump it up or reduce it um from your calculations um and just be sure to adjust your psi on the control unit first not increasing the gas bottle so um, sometimes people will uh, try and get that extra five or ten psi um, through um, increasing the uh, gas bottle uh, regulator uh, quite extensively and then uh, might, might be getting nearly there and then start to adjust on the controller um, that can cause you know once you open up that controller if you've if you've opened up extensively the regulator uh, on the gas bottle that can cause that to overpressurize and potentially blow a solid in or something like that. So just be sure to adjust as best as, you, as most as you can firstly on the control unit. Um, and goes without saying, but uh, good solid connection on all your tubing, gas fittings, push fittings. Um, you just want to make sure that all of those are uh, nice and tight before you do it um, instead of having to pull the pump back up again. Um, that little thread in between the your twin bonded tubing uh, is good to just remove that before you put it into your connections and um, just things like that. So wherever you utilize uh, so some previous projects that we've been done, uh, which we'll finish on and then we'll just move to the Q&A. So 
Jacobs, uh, we partnered with Jacobs and, and Delp a few years back uh, to dedicate some of the 408 uh, double valve pumps. There was a number of around 30 bores uh, which needed to obtain some samples from up to uh, 1,200 metres deep. Um, this is quite a unique project uh, in that um, it provided a lot of challenges which needed to be uh, overcome in order to achieve this, as you can probably imagine. Um, so we utilised the, we did a, a extensive uh, research onto what would be the best pump for the job. And uh, we ended up utilising the 408 double valve, uh, which we found was able to obtain uh, the best samples at these particular depths. Um, the issues that come about from this, we encountered some um, buoyancy issues at around the um, 300 metre mark when wanting to install this. So if you can see on the image uh, there, we had to actually install a bit of a custom um, milled uh, spike at the bottom, which is literally just a solid piece of um, milled stainless steel that would just allow enough weight to counteract the buoyancy of the long sample tube and the long um, drive line tubing to stop the pump from coming back up on itself. Uh, we also altered the tubing from uh, the more common LDPE to uh, a thick like HDPE uh, because we were seeing uh, pressure influencing the compression of the more thinly walled LDPE at these greater depths. There was also the issue of dissolved gas samples, um, which were required uh, as they came up to surface and were depressurizing from that, that type of depth. Uh, so we had to basically uh, take a set volume of, of sample into a, a water gas chamber and, and sparge it with nitrogen gas to essentially strip the sample of dissolved gases and store those dissolved gases into a sumo canister and analyze them at the lab. So. That was a very challenging process and the image of that actual uh, contraption is, is there. So that was a difficult process that we had to uh, overcome for that particular project. Um, but it was a very successful one at the end of it and learnt quite a lot uh, in terms of deeper application pumps and um, able to, there's a full case study of that on the actual science website and on our website as well, if you wanted to delve uh, more deeply into that. Um, the Snowy Hydro project, uh, we dedicated and have dedicated uh, quite a lot of uh, the 408 double valve pumps um, around numerous locations. Um, that's again having ongoing expansion. So the 408 double valve is, is the pump of choice for those guys when they're uh, uh, dedicating uh, all of their sampling bores and monitoring bores. And so that's seen a lot of success there and with some great countryside to uh, be installing those pumps at. Uh, the, the applications again were sort of in that deeper range of around 200 and 300 meters, and I'm um, still seeing uh, more of that, more of those type of depths as we move on through it. Uh, the Minja Gold project, uh, there was uh, some bladder pump dedication as well, so you can dedicate those the bladder pumps as well as I spoke about. Um, the dedication of those, um, you know, why would we move to having a bladder pump? Uh, with a drop tube versus the double valve. Uh, again, there's this might be some considerations with your VOC sampling, so there might be a choice over one or the other. Uh, we found that uh, actually getting a sample up and getting an amount of sample is a bit easier. Um, for example, having a double valve pump at 300 meters versus having a bladder pump at 100 meters and putting a drop tube assembly down to there. Um, so we typically just say for the, the much deeper stuff, um, to utilize the double valve. And uh, there's a large network of, of dedicated double valves in the Heathgate resources as well. So we've utilized quite a few projects where there's a lot of these pumps around and uh, continue to work closely with all these clients. So I guess that brings us to um, the end there. Um, so thank you very much uh, for watching. Um, we'll take this time now to uh, answer, answer any questions that you guys might have. And um, I'll just bring up some of this. Uh, we just had a bit of uh, technical issues with the uh, screen sharing, so you guys will be able to see these questions, but I will still read them out anyway. Um, 
So, Jasper, you got, have you got any data of PFAS contamination by the pump through seals, valves, etc., on samples? Is there a difference between the two different pumps in this aspect? Uh, recently, we've had some uh, inquiries into whether these pumps can be utilised for PFAS um, sampling. There is ongoing talks with Solenced, and we are coming up with some solutions um, to have these pumps be utilised for um, some potential PFAS sampling. There is some declarations from uh, Solenced um, around the uh, PFAS, there's no PFAS contamination in a lot of their components within the pump. And we take the steps of also um, changing the, the common Teflon uh, check balls to stainless steel ones. Uh, we've got, we're doing some more um, testing on that particular setup, but we are coming to uh, something along with the declarations and also changing a few things from the Teflon, obviously, to stainless steel to hopefully have a very robust sort of um, uh, capability to uh, suggest these pumps for further PFAS um, applications. If I have a fast recovering bore, is it still not recommended to use a vent lower than your drive? Yeah, if you have a very fast recovering bore, Jasper, that that might be okay. As I said, you can have you can have a reduced vent time. Uh, again, it's really just um, dependent on your bore. If your bore is recovering um, immensely, then by all means, you know, if you can increase, if you can uh, have a drive time that's uh, more than your vent, then then you're in a really great spot. So it's just really um, determining on your recovery of, of your bore. So just don't take those, um, what I'm saying is just don't take the vent um, to be less than your drive nine times out of 10 will probably be the case. Uh, so don't try and implement that with a lot of the bores. If you have really fast ones, then um, certainly you can you can do that. So Joanne, cheat sheet would be excellent. Thanks, that's no worries, Joanne. We'll uh, make a note there um, to send that through to you. Uh, that's no problem at all. Does the 407 pump need to sit below the standing water level or only the drop tube? Andrew, the 407 pump will need to sit um, below the, the standing water level because we're relying on our hydrostatic pressure to move the water up um, from the pump intake, wherever you want to sit that, um, up into that bladder. So, yes, we will need to sit that. You actually need to sit that pump um, below the standing water level. Are there any other pumps that would be recommended for PFAS? Um, Jasper, it's a point of contention at the moment and quite a tricky process. Um, I've come uh, into contact with um, suppliers that maybe suggest that they uh, can have um, some pumps recommended for PFAS. Um, I just uh, take the caution there in that you want to make sure that um, as we know, a tricky beast of PFAS being um, that you analyse each and every component of the um, pump before you uh, make that choice. And if you have declarations from your supplier that say that there's no known contaminant of PFAS in their um, inner workings of the pump, that's probably your best poise. Um, people, some suppliers out there like to claim that they have a PFAS free solution, but they might not have checked that you know, um, the internal O-rings might be Teflon or something like that. So just important to make sure you have declarations for more of that. Um, if I do find something that's a fully um, PFAS free recommended pump, I'll be sure to let you know. Uh, again, as I said, I'm working through that with um, with Solence at the moment. And we have probably the best poise place where uh, if we change those Teflon balls with stainless steel and we have declarations um, from Solence um, as a general one saying that they are not known to have PFAS contamination and their um, VTON O-rings and that sort of thing as a component within the pump uh, are not known to have PFAS contamination and can provide those declarations to you. That's probably one of the best poise so far solutions that I've come across. So happy to do that for you, Jasper, if you require. Thanks, Luke. 
Um, what are the pumps rated for PSI? Um, the pumps rated for the PSI, it's not a huge, um, there's no real rating on the PSI uh, for the particular pump. It's more so your problems with the controllers. Um, I don't think there's going to be uh, an instance where you'll damage any internal components with high PSI ratings within the pump. Um, or that certainly I haven't come across that, but um, if there's uh, something else I can derive from that um, from Solence, then I'll be sure to let you know, but I'll just take that, that one down, Joseph. Um, but for my knowledge, it's more so going to be your components at the surface rather than the actual internal workings of the pump rated for your PSI. Um, what you can find though, is if you have really high PSI ratings, um, in your in other pumps with your bladders that has a potential to uh, blow off the way that the silenced bladder bladders uh, actually install uh, gives yourself a great allowance to avoid that happening um, that's probably the only instance i've seen where in any internal components are affected by higher psi ratings uh, is it possible to provide these slides to us and share with colleagues who could not attend um, yeah certainly patrick i'll be able to um uh, get some slides um, to you for sure on that. So I'll just make a note of that as well, Pat, and um, be sure to um, let you know with some of those slides. So that might do us uh, for the questions. Uh, I don't see any more coming in. So um, once again, uh, thank you all for uh, attending this. I hope you might have taken um, something away from it all. Um, as I said, in the coming weeks and months, we'll be putting out um, these other short presentations uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so just be on the lookout for those if you have uh, a little bit of time in, in your lunch break and appreciate you guys taking the time to, uh, to listen to us. So uh, from Hydroterra and from myself, thank you all for uh, attending and um, to those people that have put the questions and have asked for um, some more documentation, we'll get that uh, through to you. So thank you all uh, and enjoy.